you ever wondered if there were other periods in history when people had negative attitudes towards boned corsets? We all know that much of our modern day society is rather anti-corset, but is our time period unique in history or have there been other time periods where they felt negatively towards corsets? If ever there were another time period when society felt negatively towards corsets, I would argue that it was the Regency period. In this video, we will be learning how I made a reproduction of a real 1820 pair of stays from a self-drafted pattern. We'll learn a secret for making complicated corset cording go quickly, smoothly, and easily. We're going to learn how to insert bust gussets and how to avoid the mistakes that I made. We're also going to learn what makes Regency corsets different from all the other time periods of corsets. I'll answer the question of whether or not Regency stays are a good option for modern day daily corset wearers. Finally, I will tackle the most common criticism of this type of corset. That is the wooden busk. Is it constricting and does it restrict body movement? Let's dive into all of that right now. Before we jump into the tutorial of how to make these Regency stays, I would love for you to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell, and that way you will never miss a future historical sewing video. And I would love to have you join this historical sewing community that we've created here on YouTube. So let's jump into it. Okay, so I drafted my particular pattern from Mandy Barrington's book, Stays and Corsets. This pattern is taken from an original 1820 set of stays, and it walks you through directions to draft a replica pattern based on your own measurements. So that's what I went ahead and did. I then did a paper mock-up where I just taped my paper pattern pieces together, held it up on the dress form just to eliminate any obvious glaring errors. And then I went ahead and I made a rather messy fabric mock-up, but it did the trick. One of the main things I decided was to make the bust gussets a little bit longer because I'd experimented with shortening them. Also refining the bottom edge line to make sure it's smooth. In this mock-up, I actually experimented with cutting the pattern pieces on the bias, but I didn't go on to do that in my final set of stays. And there's my finished pattern all altered and ready to go. Okay, so it's time to cut out our pattern pieces. I made my set of stays using coutille as the strength fabric and cotton sateen as the outer fashion fabric. To make a corded set of stays, it's essential to have two layers in order to sandwich the cording between them. But there are bone stays where you can just use one layer of fabric and boning channel tape or flat felt seams to contain the boning. So I traced around my pattern pieces, which did not contain seam allowance. This is the front panel piece. Before I added seam allowance, I decided to refer to my copy of corsets and crinolines because there is a section in there on directions for making a set of Regency stays. So I just wanted to make sure what construction technique I'd be using before adding my seam allowance. I went ahead and added my seam allowance to my pattern pieces and cut them out, but I didn't cut along the openings for the bust or hip gussets yet. I just left the outlines there to cut into later. So now it's time to work with our layer of cotton sateen. So I'm basically just going to repeat the process, except this time, instead of using my paper pattern pieces, I'm just going to use my coutille pattern pieces, which have already been cut out with seam allowance and simply trace around them and cut out. You can notice that I'm actually cutting a lot of extra seam allowance and that's because in the cording technique that I'm going to teach you in this video, you need to have a lot of extra seam allowance on your fashion fabric layer. And there are my finished pattern pieces all ready to go. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and show you two different techniques that I use for inserting my bust gussets on the two respective sides of my stays. Now to insert any bust gussets, you're going to begin by cutting open the area where the gussets will go and then pressing the seam allowances under. Then I trace this same opening onto my cotton sateen fashion layer because I hadn't done that yet. 
And I repeated the process on that layer of fabric, cutting open the bust gusset area and then pressing the seam allowances under. There we go. So the first technique I use, which I do not recommend, is I decided to work with the bust gussets as one layer, so the cutile and the sateen in one. I traced my seam allowance onto that to make sure it was accurate and then I pinned it in place only to the sateen layer and I'm going to explain in a moment why I don't recommend this approach. And I carefully top stitch around the edge of these bus gussets to hold them in place. Okay, so I've run into a couple issues. First of all, I have decided to insert my gussets in two different ways. On the first half of the corset, I did kind of a strange approach that I came up with out of my own head, where I have cotton sateen and the cutile acting as one layer, and I sewed them both just to the sateen body piece, with the idea that I would later take the cotton cutile and hand stitch it down on the inside. The only problem with that that I'm realizing is that really the gusset should have been machined to the cutile. The only reason I didn't do that was so that I could have the visible top stitching on the front. I'm just worried that it's not going to be strong enough, these hand stitches. So I'm going to have to do some weird stuff to work around that. Needless to say, on the second half of the corset, I decided to do a more standard approach and just sew the cutile gussets to the cutile and the sateen gussets to the sateen. So I repeated this process with the hip gores as well. The next step was trimming down the seam allowances and I actually graded my seam allowances, which means that I cut one layer of the seam allowance narrower than the other layer, so it would be more streamlined. And then I pinned my cutile layer on top of that. Again, this is the technique that I don't recommend using but it did work in the end. And then I went ahead and I hand stitched the cutile down, doing my best to keep it in line with the outline of the gore from the front side of the stays. So here are my two different halves and you can see the difference between the two. The first technique that I don't rec recommend has a lot more bumps and unevenness. And then the second half is a lot more smooth and streamlined. You can see that I'm, there's still two separate layers, so I had to pin them together temporarily over the gores. Okay, it's time for one of the funnest parts of making these stays, which is adding the wooden busk. I used a curved 14 inch long wooden busk from Red Threaded, which I really recommend. So I began by stitching the center front seam of the stays closed. So the seam is on the inside of the stays and now I'm just pressing that open. Now I decided to use chamois leather to create my inner pocket that will hold the busk. I simply did this because I felt it would be a little more durable than using fabric. It also has a little bit of stretch in it, so it's a little more forgiving. So I simply sewed a sleeve out of the chamois leather for the busk. I turned it right side out. The next thing I had to figure out was how to create the look of a busk channel on the outside of the corset, but it wasn't actually going to be holding the busk in place. The busk was going to be in that inner pocket that I already showed you. So I just simply traced the width of the busk and then sewed two lines of stitching right from the front of the stays. And again, this was just for looks. This wouldn't actually be holding the busk in place. As per the original extant stays, I decided to add some cording on either side of this pretend busk pocket. adding my busk into the actual pocket. You can see the nice curve that this busk has. It curves inward at the bust and then it curves a little outward over the tummy area and I really like that. Now later in the process, after the cording was finished on the stays, I went ahead and I hand stitched the busk pocket, so the chamois leather sleeve, 
to the inside of the stays, being doing my absolute best not to have the stitches pass through to the very front. I later realized that this busk pocket was a little too wide and it was giving a little too much wiggle room for the busk. And so I later did decide to add some hand stitches that go right through to the front to hold the busk in more tightly in the busk pocket. And this helped to prevent wrinkling. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how I completed the complicated cording for these pair of stays in the quickest and most effective way possible. I originally learned cording in a much more labor intensive way where you first sew a bunch of narrow channels and then pull each row of cording through with a tapestry needle. This takes a lot of time and I've since found a much quicker, much easier technique. This technique requires that you first sew one line in the direction that your cording is going to be going. So of course I first referred to my pattern to mark the general direction of each section of cording, working one section at a time. And then I inserted my yarn, my cotton yarn that I was using, and I used the bottom end of this pair of tweezers just to push it in flush against that line of stitching. And then I used a very, very narrow zipper foot to sew alongside that piece of yarn, stitching it in place. What makes this so effective is that it basically cuts your time spent in at least half because you're sewing your channels at the same time as inserting the cording into the channels rather than having to first sew the channels and then painstakingly pull a needle through these very narrow channels. I love this technique because it allows me to produce much more complicated designs of cording than I would otherwise ever attempt if I was using the old technique. So now I'm adding my diagonal cording, which is next to the bust cups. You can see how the shape of this cording really almost creates an underwire sort of effect, similar to a modern bra. And there's the finished cording for the front panel. I love the look of cording on Regency stays. I think it just adds so much depth and character to these stays. So now I'm marking the general direction of the cording on my back panels. This cording took a little longer because the back panels are very long and I'm just sewing in that cording using the very same technique that I already explained. Time to trim off the extra fabric around the edges and the extra yarn that's hanging out and there is all of my completed cording. Cording makes for a very soft, comfortable, and flexible pair of stays which still have some support and rigidity and I really recommend trying it out. Okay, so it's time to attach these panels together now. Since the extant corset didn't have any kind of visible flat felled seams, what I opted to do was to sew the seam to the inside of the stays. So I'm first just trimming off that extra cotton sateen that, you, that you'll remember we added extra seam allowance in the beginning. And I'm pinning these together with the seam to the inside of the stays. And now I'm just sewing that seam in place. trimming down some more extra cotton sateen and then pressing that seam open very carefully over a tailor's hand. Now it's time to do some hand felling. So I press these seam allowances under to create a felled seam and I did this by hand so that the stitches wouldn't show through to the front of the stays as per the original extant stays. This seam was so narrow and rigid in some areas that it almost acted as another row of cording. Okay, so it's time to add a back facing so we can create our eyelets and finish up that back edge. The reason I added a separate facing rather than folding over a facing was because the back edge of this pair of stays is 
very unique. It's actually curved. And that's one of the reasons I love these stays so much because I have a very pronounced inner back curve and it feels very comfortable. So I added up my facing. Now for a detailed explanation of how to sew eyelets, I recommend checking out my previous video, which will be linked in the description on how to create hand stitched eyelets. And I'll go into great detail in that video of how to do this. Hand stitch eyelets really add so much softness and beauty and historical accuracy to stays and corsets, and I really recommend giving it a try. It doesn't have to be nearly as difficult as you might imagine with a little practice and just using the right techniques. So I'm just stitching my eyelets in place, and there they are when several of them are finished. So now it's time to add our binding. I actually created my own bias binding out of just some white quilting cotton. And so I'm just using my quilting clips to clip that in place for the first pass of stitching. Stitching all around those straps. Now it's time for the second pass of stitching the binding down around to the front of the space. This took a little finagling to get the binding to lay flat and to go over the corners of the straps, but it was well worth it. Another option would be of course to do this by hand, but at this point I was just ready to finish up these stays. And there it is with the binding all completed. So this is one of my favorite elements of these particular pair of stays and that is the beautiful hand quilting in the original. So I referred to my original pattern and pattern book just to reacquaint myself with the placement of this hand quilting and how exactly it would look. There are two separate components to the decorative stitching on these stays. The first is just a plain back stitch that forms a crisscross pattern in a triangular shape at the front tummy area. So I'm just going over those lines using my favorite hand stitching thread, which is pearl cotton, doing a back stitch. what it looks like when it's finished. It's well worth the effort and it took a lot less time than I expected. The second component of stitching was doing this stem stitch that follows a curved line pattern and this was on the front as well as the back of the stays and I really love how it turned out. It adds a very nice three-dimensional element to the stitching. And here are my finished stays! <laughs> 
okay, so I finished my Regency stays. How do I like them? How did they turn out? Right off the bat, I'd like to say that this is my first ever pair of Regency stays and I absolutely love them. I was so, so pleasantly surprised at how they turned out. They are truly very different from most other eras of corsets and that's something I'm going to be talking to you about in a moment. But what surprised me the most about this type of corset was the fact that it has all of the traditional benefits that those of us in the corset wearing and historical sewing community like to think of when it comes to corset wearing. So there's the posture support. There's the nice deep pressure therapy on your abdomen. There's the nice bust shaping, everything. But it does all those things while also remaining very soft and very flexible and just very ultra comfortable. Like I'm a person who finds most well-fitting corsets that I have made to fit my body to be comfortable. I'm not going to say that they're uncomfortable, but this is ultra comfortable. If anything, the one, I guess, criticism I have right now, it's something that I could easily fix though, is that because this particular pair of Regency stays doesn't have any boning, it's just fully corded, I am noticing some diagonal wrinkling that's taking place, especially around the bust gusset area. But I do think that if I were to hand stitch a boning channel on the inside of the stays going diagonally down from this area that it would prevent that from happening. So that's something I might look at doing soon. Okay, so now we're going to talk about what makes Regency stays so different from all the other time periods of corsets and stays. Are you intrigued? Keep on listening. This is going to be really interesting to talk about. Okay, so first of all, in order to understand Regency stays, we have to understand that they did not just come out of a vacuum. Let's look at the time period preceding the Regency period to see what the people were sort of reacting against. So Regency, the Regency period was at the beginning of the 1800s, up until I like to think of the Regency fashion period as ending around the 1830s. That's when the fashions had quite a change and obviously that's when we're entering into the Victorian era. So the Regency period is the beginning of the 1800s. Obviously preceding that would be the entire 18th century. And if you look at the fashions of the 18th century, there certainly were a lot of variations of style during that time period. But what we see consistently, actually starting in the 1600s all the way through the 1700s, is the type of corsets they wore were very rigid heavily boned and gave a conical shape. And what I mean by conical, apart from the fact that it obviously made a woman's body or a man, if he was wearing them, have a cone-like shape, in terms of the bust shaping, they were very flat. They definitely gave more of a flattened appearance to the bust, at least in the area that the corset was covering. And so if you look at the Regency period, it's really fascinating to see how far the pendulum of fashion swung from that extreme to the far other extreme, which would be that if you look at Regency stays and the pair that I just made, they're very soft, very flexible, very lightly boned. I'm going to talk more about boning in a moment. The biggest difference is what they did to the body. So you have to understand that Regency fashions and aesthetics were heavily in influenced by the neoclassical period. They were influenced by Greek and Roman aesthetics, especially if you think of the sculptures and the statues that were produced during those times and the paintings that were painted of, you know, Greek and Roman gods and things like that. And um, even the architecture, I'm going to talk more about that in a moment too. They wanted to sort of bring back a more natural appearance to the human body less clothing, less layers of clothing over the body and kind of hiding the shape of the body. They basically wanted to, I think, embrace the natural beauty of the human body. And so this meant that in terms of corsets, not only were they thinner and much more soft, flexible, and more lightly boned than the stays of the 1700s, but they also, for the first time, introduced bust shaping into women's corsets. So they were no longer trying to flatten the bust into a conical shape. They were inserting bust gussets and allowing for that curvature of the bust to take place. Because again, they were looking for, I mean, if you look at the, the artwork and the aesthetics that come out of the Greek and Roman period, obviously a lot of it was a celebration of the beauty of the nude human form. So obviously people weren't going to walk around naked, but they were trying to embrace the natural beauty of the naked body, but in a way where they were still wearing clothes, they were still shaping the bust in terms of women's clothing, but it was just closer to that aesthetic. 
Something that surprised me in making my set of stays was that I'd heard all this about how the Regency period was influenced by Greek and Roman aesthetics, but what I thought that meant was that I would feel like Venus coming out of the sea or like one of those Greek and Roman gods. And I guess I could say they make me feel like that. But if anything, I feel like the embodiment of a pillar, like a stone pillar in a Greek or Roman big stone building <laughs> in the best of ways. It's very like, it's a very nice feeling. It's very elongating to my spine because that back curvature is built into the pattern and the front is so straight from the wooden busk. It really just feels like it elongates my spine and makes me feel like a pillar in the best of ways. Okay, so I'd actually like to read you a quote from the Regency period about how to construct their types of corsets. Corsets and Crinolines is a great book. She has lots of quotes from the time periods of people talking about the fashions, both positively and negatively. So I'm gonna read you a quote about what they thought about boning. And remember, they're coming out of the 1700s when fully boned stays were the norm. Certainly half boned, but almost fully boned. Okay, so here's a quote. It is as well to observe that unless particularly feeble or otherwise an invalid, it is most desirable to wear as few bones as possible. And that for healthy persons, the two back bones with the steel in front are quite sufficient. So there we go. There's wisdom from a corset maker in the Regency period saying that in her opinion, I think it was a woman, there should only be boning at the very back and the busk or the big piece of boning in the center front, unless you are particularly feeble or desiring extra support. So that is very interesting. Let's dive right into talking about one of the biggest controversies around this type of corset or stays, at least from most people today, like non-corset wearing people. <laughs> the biggest criticism is the wooden busk because most modern people will look at these and be like, yeah, they look very soft, they look very comfortable, but hang on a sec, what's that? That big piece of wood right there in the front. Women couldn't do anything when they were wearing those. They wouldn't be able to bend over. They would feel very uncomfortable and very constrained. Not good. So I'm gonna read you another quote. This quote is actually from one of my favorite books, Stays in Corsets by Mandy Barrington, but this is one of the few things I disagree with her on. And it's her commentary on this particular corset that I made. Okay, so she's talking about how this is so soft and it doesn't really reduce the waist. The rest of the corset was corded and sometimes quilted. No additional bones were added unless required to give a fuller figure further control. Although this style of corset was not tightly laced, the garment was, however, still restricting, with the large central busk preventing the wearer from bending forward. So let's dive into that. Does the wooden bust really prevent the wearer from bending forward? Okay, so let me preface this why I have such a strong opinion on this exact topic of a wooden busk. I am a mom of four, if you don't already know, and over the course of having gone through my four pregnancies, births, and postpartums, I've inadvertently learned a lot about just the ideal ways on a physiological level to move our bodies in order to best avoid injury and issues, like the types of injuries, issues, and pains that can typically come about throughout pregnancies, births, postpartums, carrying babies all over the house all the time, etc. So I've learned a lot about what's the ideal way to stand, to hold yourself on a postural level. What's the ideal way to sit down, lie down, bend over, and especially what's the most safe way to bend over and pick things up that are heavy, like babies and children. <laughs> so let's talk about this. One of the biggest, most important points I've learned that is most applicable to this topic is the best way to, to bend over and pick something up or even just to bend over in general. And that is actually not to bend from your waist. The best way to bend over and pick anything up is from your hips and to go into a squat, pick things up, or even if you're just bending over, not to pick anything up. The ideal way to do it is to bend from your hips and keep your back straight throughout the process. And let me tell you, 
This is one of the biggest reasons why I absolutely love the wooden busk, because not only does it certainly not prevent me from being able to bend over, but it's a very gentle reminder to me to keep bending in the proper way to avoid injury to myself, which is to bend from my hips. Even if it is my natural tendency or others' natural tendency to want to bend from the waist when you're wearing the busk, it's just like, oh no, don't do that. Bend from your hips. So it's just a really nice reminder. Apart from the bending over thing, on a postural level, I really, really love the wooden busk because it helps me have an elongated spine because my front is kept very straight and my back is very curved and that's actually drafted right into the corset. So it feels really amazing actually to have an elongated spine. I really, really love this on a postural level, on a lifestyle level, on a teaching me how to bend over properly level. So I really recommend Regency Stays and I don't think you should be afraid of the wooden busk whatsoever. Okay guys, thanks so much for watching this video and for joining me on this fun exploration of Regency Stays, how to make them and what makes them so different. Consider subscribing to my channel if you haven't already and hitting that alarm bell so you'll be notified when I release another historical sewing video. I'd love for you to join this historical sewing community that we've created together here on YouTube. The accompanying blog post to this video, which will give all the written details of how I made this, will be linked in the description as well as all of my social media accounts. I would love to hear your comments and questions below. I'd love to hear about what sewing projects you're working on. We can chat about it in the comments section. Don't forget to give this video a like because it helps this kind of content and this video get out to more people who are interested and I would really appreciate your help with that. Okay guys, I'll see you all on the next video. Bye! Thank you.